This is Austin Harif. He's accused of killing Michelle Michon, 53, and John Stevens, the third, 59, at their Southeast Kokomo Lane home in Martin County, Florida, on August 15, 2016. Authorities say that on the night of the murders, Harif became angry during dinner at a restaurant called Duffy Sports Grill. He then walked about four miles north, stopping one street short of his father's home, and then going to a different home where he encountered Stevens and Michon. Harif, who was then attending Florida State University, was found by police biting and chewing on Stevens' face in the couple's driveway. As officers tried to talk to the then 19-year-old, Harif spat a chunk of flesh out of his mouth and admitted it was human. The police reported that Harif was on top of John and chewing his face when they found the alleged killer. Officers shouted at the then teenager who was growling like a dog to get off the victims, but he wouldn't listen and was eventually only pulled off after being tased multiple times and being bitten by a police dog. A neighbor who tried to stop the attack, Jeff Fisher, was also stabbed several times but managed to run home and call police. Harif held on to the last bite in his mouth until he got to the hospital and spat out the flesh according to documents released in the case. A forensic psychologist says the former college student believed he was half dog, half man when he fatally attacked Michonne and Stevens. Dr. Philip Resnick, hired by Harif's defense team, concluded that Harif suffered from severe mental illness, particularly bipolar disorder and acute manic episodes with psychotic features, and these mental health issues were a factor in Harif's attack. To arrive at this conclusion, Resnick said that he spent six hours interviewing Harif at the Martin County Jail interviewed his friends and family, and reviewed his videos and online searches. After being arrested, Harif dared the police to test him for drugs. He subsequently tested negative for common street drugs like cocaine, heroin, marijuana, and methamphetamine. Toxicology tests also showed the 19-year-old didn't have flocker or bath salts in his system that August night, as some have speculated. Harif faces two counts of first-degree murder with a weapon for the deaths of Michon and Stevens one charge of burglary of a dwelling with assault or battery while armed for breaking into their garage, and one charge of attempted first-degree murder with a weapon for attacking and injuring the couple's neighbor, Jeffrey Fisher. While Austin Harif was still hospitalized, Wade Harif, the suspect's father, talked to the TV personality, Dr. Phil, about the four-hour walk in the woods they took on the morning of the attack and how Austin was worried about an evil presence. Wade Harif also told the TV host that his son disappeared during their family dinner that night and then walked two miles to his mother's house. There he said the younger Harif tried to drink a bottle of cooking oil before pouring it in a bowl, dousing it in Parmesan cheese, and attempting to eat it with a spoon. While still in the hospital following the attack, Austin Harif also recorded an episode with Dr. Phil to explain his side of the story. The episode of Dr. Phil, which was promoted as, quote, the frat boy dubbed the cannibal killer breaks his silence from his hospital bed, end quote, was supposed to air on October 28, 2016, but after outrage from the victim's family, it was postponed. Producers said a new development in the case was behind the schedule change, but no new evidence has been released. The other explanation producers offered was to minimize harm to the victim's family. Harif has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder and his other charges. He is currently awaiting trial in the Florida County Jail. The following is his previously unaired interview with Dr. Phil. You said there were two incidences. Um, one you didn't remember about the devil talking to you with regard to your friend. But then there was the time when you said you were getting really serious and your friend just felt uncomfortable around you. Were you aware that you had made a shift in your thinking that was making people uncomfortable? Um, not really. Like, I was aware that something, like, I was aware that I became more serious in things, but I wasn't aware that I was pushing people away, and I <clears throat> didn't know it was affecting my relationships with my friends. Or with my friend. Mm -hmm. But you were aware that you hadn't been spending as much time with him, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you were making these videos that you were putting up on YouTube, mm -hmm. you said you were doing voices and stuff, just acting silly, because, you know, yeah. like you, people do on YouTube. That wasn't yeah. 
that wasn't like being possessed or something. You were just acting silly in that regard. But um, the, the content that you were putting up there about not doing steroids and that sort of thing, did you ever do steroids? Never. Never, ever did steroids. Never, never tried it once, never. <clears throat> You know, I asked you earlier that there was this theory about Flocka, mm -hmm. that you had somehow taken F Flocka. Do you know what Flocka is? Is it is it a crystal or something? I I don't know. So my dad told me it was a crystal or something. Have you ever taken Flocka? No. You didn't take it the day of the incident. No. Have any of your friends ever taken Flocka? No. Do you know anyone that's ever taken Flocka? No. Have, have you ever have you ever seen the drug itself? No. Is there any chance anybody could have slipped that drug into your food or into something you drank or poisoned you with it, contaminated you with it that day? I drank a uh some tea at Duffy's, so I was told, so but, I, don't, I don't think they would poison me or anybody would poison me. Right. Others drank there too, and they yeah. had no reaction, right? Yes. Um, so when this tox screen comes back, they're not going to find those substances in your tox screen, correct? No, no. And um, so... There's just, and you've you've heard of bath salts, right? You I mean you've read about that and heard about? It. Have you ever taken anything like that? No. So never there's seen it. never seen it. Have you any of your friends ever taken it? No. Uh huh. So there's just no way that has anything, in your opinion, there's just no way that has anything to do with this incident or what took place. Oh. Yeah. You say when you left the restaurant that night, the night of the incident, yeah. that when you left there, were you confused or were you thinking straight in your opinion? I don't remember thinking at all. I just, it's like a blur, sort <clears throat> of. So I, I, don't, I don't think I was thinking straight. And how long was it after you left that you saw Daniel? Um, was it 10 minutes, 30 minutes, a mile away, half a mile away? I think uh, maybe five minutes from the house. So uh -huh. I don't know how far <clears throat> it would have been. Okay. But well, right when I saw him, I panicked and tried to get help. Were you running or walking when you saw him? Uh, I think I was running, but I don't have a clear memory. Mm -hmm. Take me through, and I'm, I mean this is just from your experience, there's no right or wrong answer here. Just from your experience, take me through the moment you saw Daniel. What went through your mind when you saw Daniel? Um, like when I saw him, it wasn't like a clear person, it was like a dark figure because it was like pitch black outside and I couldn't really see it. But I heard his voice distinctly and like when I saw him, I just got scared out of my mind. Mm -hmm. But you, did you like, know it was him by his, I'm sorry, did you know it was him by his voice or by his, the visual? By his voice. Mm hmm But you did see a figure. Yes. And what did the voice say that scared you? It said, hey, Austin. Mm hmm What happened? Uh, okay, there we go. Okay. He, he, he said, just, hey, Austin, and I just got scared for some reason. Uh -huh. It just, like, I, just, I guess it just scared me to see him, like, all of a sudden, I don't know. 
Mm -hmm. And it, it's what you knew about him from before that scared you. Yeah. Uh, he didn't threaten you that night. It's just him being there. Yeah. And what did you say to yourself? I need to, I guess, I need to get, need to find someone to help me or, like, figure out where I'm going. Mm-hmm. So. I don't, I, don't, I don't really remember <clears throat> what I said to myself. I just remember being afraid and being scared. So you, you, you panicked at that point? Yeah. Did you run? Yeah. Uh-huh. And so you ran down that street, and is that when you saw the open garage door? Yes. Do you remember when you took your clothing off? Was it before you saw Daniel or after? I didn't remember it at first, but I have a faint memory of taking my pants off at some point before I saw Daniel, but like I, n I never realized that my clothes were off later. Like, mm -hmm. like it's, it's hard to explain, you know? <clears throat> right. It's, it kind of runs together for you. Yeah. When you ran up into that garage, um, and the woman was there, were you running to her for help? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I ran up to her. I think I just, I think I just screamed at and then it's a blur. But you think it was just your voice, you yelled? No, I didn't, I don't think I yelled. I think I just was, I just showed up and she was shocked that I was, um, I guess almost naked, but I mean, I, I understand that, but I didn't know, I didn't know I was not clothed properly. Right. Um, do you remember the first thing that she said? <clears throat> no. I don't remember what she said. Do you I remember? I just remember being yelled at. Do you remember what happened next? Not, no. I, I don't, I don't, like I have some memory of what happened, but I don't remember how we got in, into the altercation or into the fighting. I don't, I don't remember. Do you remember her husband coming out? Yeah. Uh-huh. And do you remember what he said? No. Mm -hmm. And y you said that you had a machete at that point. Do you remember where you got it? I think somewhere in the garage. I'm, I think in the left left corner or something, I don't know. Uh-huh. Do you know why you picked it up? No. Uh -huh. I think, I don't know. Uh-huh. And was there a time during this incident that you realized what was going on? No. Was like, there, go ahead. Like, I didn't, like, it's like, it's like it happened, but I, I don't, it's like, it's distorted, like, it's, it happened, but, like, I wasn't aware of it at the time, like, I remember, like, at the end, I remember leaving a dog, hijacking their car. You remember leaving a seeing a dog in what? Saving a dog and hijacking their car, uh -huh. and then it's a blur. Right. Um, have you seen a picture of this couple? Uh, yes. 
since the incident? Yes. Um, when you, you saw that picture and realized that these were the people that this has happened to, how did you feel? I felt terrible and I really, really don't have words to explain how I feel. It's like, it's like a nightmare. Is it hard for you to imagine that you did this to these two people? Yeah. It's the hardest thing I've ever gone through. Or I never imagined that this would ever happen. And I'm deeply sorry to the family that was affected. And I hope that something like this never happens again. I. I didn't ever want to consciously do something like this, or I never planned it. I never, I didn't want to do it. And like, I don't know, I don't know what to say. If their family members are watching this right now, what do you say to them? Look into the camera right now, and if they're watching, what do you say to them? I'm sorry for their loss, and I hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me. And I'm so sorry, and I never wanted this to happen. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like a nightmare. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I just don't know how to say. I don't know how to put it into words. <laughs> Austin, are you ashamed of what you did? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to let them know that I'm so sorry. <laughs> I can imagine how it must feel to look such a close relative. And it was what happened to me. I, I would know what to do, and I would be so sad. I just, I'm just so sorry. Did you leave? Did you leave that restaurant wanting to hurt anyone? No. No. Why did you do it? I don't know. I don't know. If I knew, I would tell you. Do you think you... What? Do you think you're mentally ill? I guess so. I didn't know, though. Did you want to hurt and stab the neighbor that came running over? No, I didn't have any memory of that. I don't... I don't... I only remember him yelling at me. Well, the report is that you severely wounded him and stabbed him multiple times, and he's, he's critically wounded. And he heroically, he heroically tried to save those people. 
I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember. I think, the, from what I hear, Dr. Phil, he, he was slashed with a liquor bottle, broken liquor bottle, and he wasn't critically wounded. I'm pretty sure it wasn't critical. Well, I think, well, let's just say he was severely wounded. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember fighting him or stabbing him. It was all across the back. Right. I don't remember how my hands got like this. Mm-hmm. Well, we certainly don't mean to minimize or trivialize the injuries that happened to him because he certainly was just trying to help. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm certain that you're sorry for yeah. that. Yeah, I'm, I'm deeply sorry for him. Mm-hmm. When, um, when you went in that garage, did you drink something in that garage that you found there? I don't want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. I can't talk about that. Uh-huh. Um, you, you had severe burns to your esophagus, right? Yeah. And do you know what caused you to go into a coma? I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know at the time, but I guess I know now. Mm-hmm. And what have they told you caused you to go into the coma? Whatever I drank. Okay. And, and this, still, yes. Like, Wade, go ahead. Wade, go ahead. Like, this is coming up in five minutes. Okay. All right, we'll be done by then. You just tell me when we need to click off, okay? You felt like you had some superpowers and that you could read people, right? Yeah. Okay. And um, did you ever remember putting yourself in harm's way by stepping into traffic or anything like that? Um, well, when I was walking alone to my dad's house to get my car, I remember, like, like walking in front of cars and stuff like that. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. So, in looking back, you recognize that there has been a period of time, yeah. weeks, even months, that you have been losing touch with reality. That you've had paranoia, that you have had ideas of, of grandiosity, superpowers, being worshipped, all, I mean, godlike sorts of things that have gone on yeah. with you. And this wasn't something that just happened one night. This was something that's gone on with you for a period of time. Yeah, I guess so. And... Should the courts decide that you were in need of, of treatment, that would be something that you would lean into. You, you recognize that you, you need help and treatment, correct? Yes. You wouldn't resist that, whether it was neurology in terms of your brain, psychological treatment. Um, no, I wouldn't resist that. And, and you know that your dad and I are are working very hard to get the proper diagnosis here because putting you in a cage and sitting you over in a corner is not going to heal what ails you. We need to find this out. Yeah. And that yeah. doesn't mean that we're trying to excuse or trivialize the horrific things that happened to the people that got caught up in this. Yeah. We're not trying to trivialize that, but by the same token, we don't want to throw your life away either. Yeah. Your dad and I are going to work very hard to get to the bottom of this, and I've I've pledged that to him, and he's pledged it to you. And Thank you. All right, so you you keep you, you keep hanging in there, and we're going to keep looking for answers here. Okay. Okay. And I, I I thank you for for asking me to call you. I'm glad I did, and 
just know that you, your dad and I are standing shoulder to shoulder here working on this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Thank you, Wade. We'll talk to you soon. This has been another episode of True Crime Stories with Black Rhetoric. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video. Until next time.